Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Rizal Barkin, the Medical Director of the Prostate Cancer Research and Education Foundation. I'm holding in my hand the publication, the ASCO Post. ASCO stands for American Society of Clinical Oncology. And I noticed an article about active surveillance. Finally, you think you know everything about active surveillance and there are surprises. And I think this is an information that needs to be brought up to patients. I'm going to briefly discuss what's new here with active surveillance. The name of the article is Active Surveillance and Intermediate Risk Prostate Cancer Called Into Question. The publication was presented by Dr. Andrew Loblo. He is from Stony Brook in Canada. And the article was very, very interesting because it surprises us with the increased risk of prostate cancer specific death after 15 years in the intermediate group versus the low risk group. So let's look at the study uh, in a second here. The prospective study included 945 patients managed with active surveillance between the year 1995 to 2013. So this is one of the few studies that have a long view about what happened to those people with active surveillance. And this was done by at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center in Canada. There were 237 patients, 23.9% with intermediate risk and median follow-up of 6.9 years, and 708 with low risk and a median follow-up of 6.4 years. And I'm reading from the publication the risk of prostate cancer specific death at 15 years was 3.7 times higher for intermediate risk patients compared with low risk patients. At the same time point, it's 15 years, 11.5% versus 3.7%. So that really calls now to reevaluate the situation. What is this definition of low and intermediate risk. The people that discuss this result of this paper uh, state rightfully so that many people may be lumped into one group like intermediate, but within the intermediate there are different certification of people with more severe or less severe disease. And one of the quotation was not all Gleason 7 were created equally. And it's interesting that the John Hopkins, that used to be that Gleason 6 and below, it's low risk, and Gleason 6, 7 is intermediate, and 8 to 10 is high risk. But Gleason 7 is composed of, as you all know, the primary and the secondary grade, either 3 plus 4 or 4 plus 3. And we are not always sure that what we sample from the biopsy, and we call it majority on the biopsy was 4 and a bit of 3, whether that represent or reflect the real situation, what's happening in the prostate. And indeed, in the, one of the people that discussed the situation said that we need to add imaging in order to try to stratify better our designation of low risk, high risk, by looking also at the volume of the tumor and add perhaps new tests like spectroscopic MRI to try to show what is the volume of the cancer in order to take different consideration for each patient. And indeed, the <laughs> consensus is that in the case of active surveillance, you could not take a patient and lump him according to only the PSA. And let me repeat what originally the certification was. Below, PSA below 10 in Gleason 6 and T1C and T1A were low grade and between PSA 10 and 20, and Gleason 7, it was intermediate, and Gleason 8 to 10, and PSA above 20 was high risk. So in spite of looking at some parameters that group together the patient in the different categories of low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk, there is suggestion and discussion now about looking at markers, in prognostic markers, in order to try to stratify better uh, the, where should the patient belong? And the bottom line is that the patient actually, it patient needs to be, the, the decision what to do, regardless of which group the patient seems to be 
in the in this classification it needs to be tailored specifically to the patient a patient with cancer in 12 cores or a patient in cancer in two cores even if they belong to the same group because they have a higher glycine they are not the same risk group and it's quite alarming to find out after 15 years this prospective study that the specific mortality 15 years were about four times higher so the suggestion is and the lesson is that we need to stratify the patient better we need to look at markers we look need to look at imaging and along the way we need to follow also with those markers to see if there is any change or not for example, if we decide that the glisten is a key factor, how risky is the disease? Well, we can't monitor the glisten over a period of time and see how it is going. Yet, markers we could follow over a period of time, and imaging we could follow over a period of time, and we could bail out the patient from a group of low risk to high risk, or perhaps even the other way around. So it's very important to take into account that this classification, low risk, medium risk and high risk, they are different in different institutions. For example, John Hopkins has different definition than in Canada. They may look at doubling time and John Hopkins looks only at biopsies. So the, this classification of low risk, medium risk and high risk is maybe mandatory to create when you create clinical studies and you want to put all the patient in groups. But when you treat an individual patient, I think here you have to stratify and sort out and try to find the exact risk the patient has and have those risk tools to be able to follow them in order to decide whether to move the patient from whatever risk situation we thought he was originally when we started the active surveillance. Stay well, stay informed, and have fun. And if you have any question, write to us at info at pcref.org. Call us at 619-906-4700. Stay well. Goodbye.